I'd like to welcome everybody very much to this Travel Tuesday lecture. And thank you all for attending. I do apologize that we had to delay this talk, but uh, Christopher was without mm -hmm. internet due to terribly bad weather. So we really had little choice, but we're here this evening. We very much hope that you enjoy his talk. So I'd like now to formally introduce Dr. Christopher Tussle. And I have to say that I really should, could give the whole one hour just talking about his amazingly impressive CV. Uh, I, I sort of feel that Chris ought to be about 150 years old because he has managed to fit so much into his life. Uh, Christopher's main interest is in archaeology, and he has particularly studied the Roman and Hellenistic periods in the Eastern Mediterranean, also with an interest in mystery cults and secret societies, which all sounds very intriguing. Christopher has been former Associate Director of the Council of American Overseas Research Centers. He has traveled extensively in the Middle East to explore important archaeological sites. And of course, he has worked on excavations and very extensive surveys. For his university training, he did a BA in Classical and Medieval Studies at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. He then worked on a PhD at the Jarkowski Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World at Brown University in the States, focusing on the Nabataeans of Petra, the last independent kingdom in the area to be absorbed by the Romans. He is today ASA's academic and outreach coordinator. And in that role, he sources wonderful tour leaders for ASA. He manages the Facebook and Instagram pages. And I know he's been posting marvelously interesting posts on both Facebook and Instagram. Do think of sharing those with your Facebook friends, passing them on to anybody that you think might be interested. And Christopher is also being kept very busy with fascinating tours for ASA. I wish that I could do all of them. This year, he will be uh, leading the tour in Sicily and the Aeolian Islands with artist David Henderson, who I've been lucky enough to travel with several times. Next year, he's got a tour on Jordan in depth, the Turquoise Coast Tour, which you will be learning more about this evening and also one in Tunisia next year. And he has plans for future tours in Corsica and Sardinia. Uh, so Christopher is kept very busy indeed with ASA. He brings an amazing range of skills and a truly incredible knowledge of the ancient world, archaeology, cults, and really fascinating parts of our globe. So it gives me very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Christopher Tuttle to present this evening's Travel Tuesday lecture on the Turquoise Coast, Southern Turkey and Rhodes. Welcome, Christopher. But uh, thank you for that nice introduction, Suzanne. I really appreciate it. And I hope you do get to travel with us sometime. Um, I'd love oh, to take you around Jordan in particular, uh, or this uh, Turquoise Coast one. But welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Without further ado, I'll, well, let's get started. So we're going to talk tonight about the Turquoise Coast, Southern Turkey and Roads. All right. So anyways, I want to start out today with just a quick overview of the landmass that makes up modern Turkey. We have here on our screen from Google Earth, uh, the country of Turkey, and which is really the West Asian Peninsula extending from the Asian continent. And right up here, we can see where it almost joins the European uh, continent right there. Uh, and understanding the topography uh, is really key to understanding the history of the peoples in ancient Anatolia, or, or even all, all the way till today. The landmass is naturally divided into three zones, uh, four zones really, but what we're thinking of here is the northern littoral along the Black Sea, and you can see how narrow that strip of green land is there. Then you have the western area, which is from the Straits of Marmara here in the Sea of Marmara, down along to this river basin, and then you have the southern littoral coast all the way over here to Syria. And again, notice how narrow the, the green zones are. And then the mass of the peninsula is the uplands 
uh, shown here in the more brownish tones. And it's extremely rugged territory. So what this essentially has done and continues to do uh, is divide the, the landmass into these different regions. And that's had a very big impact on the history of the different peoples and cultures that came out of this region. The North and the South littorals are really isolated from the interior plateau and only accessible by very few mountain passes that come up from, say, like up through here and up through here. And then on this side, there's a few more of them. But it's really very much affected the history of uh, the landmass. And it's also why in the classical period, when the Greek colonists started coming over from the Balkan Peninsula, they really settled along the coastal regions because it really was the part that was accessible. And they never really made it up onto the plateau. And of course, when the Turks came in from the steppes to the east, they came in on the plateau. So today, and actually all the way back to the, the rise of the Ottomans, this was really the stronghold of the folks coming from the east and the coasts and the west region, the river valleys in the west. This is where the people and the colonists from the European continent tended to, to, be, to make it to and settle. Now, in the case of the Turquoise Coast Tour, this is the region in red here that we'll be focusing on. Um, and it really is about half of the Southern Littoral region. So just to give you an idea of, of the amount of territory that we're gonna cover. It also means that we're going to be traveling through four of the ancient regions because we actually make a little jaunt up into Pisidia. But we start in Pamphylia and go to Lycia and Caria with a little jaunt up into Pisidia. So we'll be covering a fairly significant area on this tour, and we'll be embracing that natural co coastal access into the region and only making select forays up into the highlands, not unlike what um, the early travelers did and the early colonists. So we'll be starting here in Antalya and we'll be hitting all these sites around here. And we'll be making a foray up to Sagalassos, a foray to Tumesos. And then as we travel back along the coast, we'll ultimately make a foray up to Stratonikea here. And then we'll hit the islands of Kos and end the tour in Rhodes. So I hope these initial slides give you a little bit of orientation uh, to what we'll be talking about today. Uh, but my intent is not to walk you through this entire tour. You can do that by going to the ASA website, take a look at the itinerary at your leisure, and be able to see the full extent of all the sites that we'll be visiting. Uh, the green dots on this map are the places where we overnight, and the red dots are the sites that we'll be visiting. In keeping with this lecture themes, I want to start with two of my favorite princes from the region. And they happen to be related to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So let's quickly review the seven wonders. And I put them here on this Google map where you can see the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, and the Temple of Artemis. And we'll be visiting the locations of two of those wonders, the Mausoleum, and the Colossus of Rhodes. And for those who might need a quick refresher, here's just some quick uh, fun reconstructions of some of these monuments. So the upper left, you have the Hanging Gardens. The center upper is the uh, Lighthouse of Alexandria. The far right is the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Then we have the Statue of Zeus at Olympus, the Great Pyramid of Giza, and the Colossus of Rhodes. And then, of course, the one that's going to be featured uh, tonight, and that is the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Uh, and here we've got two reconstructions. In the upper right, you can see part of the reconstructed facade that's today in the British Museum. And the lower right, you'll see, unfortunately, 
what's left of the site today. And that's a point we'll be coming back to a little later on in the tour. So moving right along, the princes I want to talk about happen to be women. And they are the Queen's Artemisia of Caria. And Artemisia I, as you can see here, um, she was born around 520 and died somewhere around 460 BC. And unfortunately, we don't have any certain statues or images of Artemisia I of Caria. We think this coin on the left is her. And a, re a relatively recent discovery of this silver oval from Halicarnassus. It's not showing her because this is a horse here on the obverse side of the coin. But on the reverse, you also have the horse again. And the horse was the symbol of Halicarnassus. But it's this little figure right here, which is thought to be the monogram for Artemisia I of Caria. So that may well be a coin that was struck during her reign. Artemisia was the second ruler to reign from the Ligdamid dynasty that ruled Caria, this area right here, from 520 to 450 BCE. Caria is shown here, and it includes the Aegean islands of Rhodes and Kos, as well as Niceros and Kalimos, but those are so tiny, I can't point them out for you. Artemis I succeeded her father, who was the founding dynast, and she ruled from 496 to 479 BC. And she was a bit of a badass queen, particularly because of her role in the second Persian attempt to conquer the free city-states of Greece. So over here we've got the Balkan Peninsula, and the country and islands associated with ancient Greece. And here's just an image to give you an idea of how big the Persian Empire was at the time. And over here, just south of this dot of Ephesus, is where Caria was. And at the time that Darius the first of the Achaemenid Persian Empire had made an attack towards... All right, so during this period, Caria was part of the Persian Empire. It was a satrapy. So it, was, it had independent rulers, but who were under the authority of the king of kings of the Persian Empire, who at that time initially was Darius I. Twice the Achaemenid Persians tried to invade Greece. The first was the Greco-Persian War, which, en which ended in defeat for the Persians with the legendary Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. And that ended Darius I's attempts to conquer Greece. But then, 10 years later, his son, Xerxes I, tried once again to conquer the Balkan Peninsula and the Greek city-states. And here we've got a quick map here to show the various attempts by Xerxes. So the yellow line shows where his armies, his overland armies came in. And the green line shows where his fleets came in. And as we all know from history, the Greeks once again defeated the Persians. And that was at the famous Battle of Thermopylae right here was where the land forces were defeated. And if you're familiar with the, uh, the story of Thermopylae and the 300 Spartans, that's where that event took place under the generalship of Leonidas. And then the fleet was defeated in the Battle of Salamis, 480 BC. And this is where Artemisia I comes in because she was, of course, on the side of the king of kings, Xerxes, and she commanded her own small fleet in the Battle of Salamis. It was only five ships, but her, you, she's shown right here in this 1868 painting by a uh, German painter, Wilhelm von Kalbach, and it's a really famous piece of history because she stood out as the only woman 
leader in this great army under Xerxes I. And he was so impressed with her that he rewarded her uh, for being one of his most loyal commanders. After the Battle of Salamis and the, and the Persians were defeated, uh, she went back and she ruled for a few more years and then was succeeded by her sons. But her dynasty basically only ruled Caria for another 30 years. About 450 BC, so that would be 30 years after the Battle of Salamis and the defeat of the Persians, the city of Halicarnassus and Caria broke away from the Persians and they actually joined the Greeks for a short while. And the purple here shows where the Athenian Empire had extended to uh, by that time. And you can see we over here by Rhodes and this peninsula right here, which is the Halicarnassus Peninsula, they had joined for a brief time one of the Athenian territorial leagues. But in truth, we know very little about Caria during this period. We know that Artemisia's dynasty came to an end, and during this 50 year period, we're not exactly sure how they ruled themselves. But in 395 BCE, Caria once again fell under Persian rule, and a new royal dynasty was established, the Hick hominids. Forget all these names, you don't need to remember them. But they would then go on to rule Halicarnassus and the region of Caria for another 70 years. Moving right along, to we're going to jump a bit in time to Artemisia II. Now she, although she bears the same name, she's not of the same dynasty as Artemisia I. She's actually from this second dynasty. She lived from 400 to 350 BCE, and she ruled in her own right from 353 to 351 BC, uh, only for two years, but we'll get to that in just a moment. But here's, we do have images of her, and this is from the statue that originally stood on the seventh wonder there, the, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, uh, and here we have the statue on the left, as is seen today in the British Museum, and a reconstruction of it on the right. So we get a sense of what she looked like. And this is where that wonder of the ancient world comes into our story. Although the monument was built as a tomb for Mausolus, who was Artemisia II's brother and husband and predecessor on the throne, but when he died, she assumed the throne, and it is actually her work that built this wonder. So although Mausolus commissioned the tomb initially, it hadn't really begun being built before he died. And it's a rather ironic that his name, Mausolus, is where we get our word today, mausoleum, to describe any freestanding above ground tombs. But I find it very fascinating that most people don't realize he didn't build it, his wife did. Now, she clearly loved her brother husband, Mausolus, and upon his death, she built the monument, uh, his tomb, and she was supposedly, the stories go, so madly in love and so destroyed by the loss of her husband that she saved the ashes of his cremation and mixed them into daily drinks. And despite that, she ended up pining away and died approximately two years later. This has led to her becoming a symbol, in, especially in the 17th century Dutch Renaissance, for the special kind of rare and pure love that can only be expressed through a chaste widowhood. Now, isn't that extremely Protestant um, <laughs> worldview? Uh, but here we see two exemplar paintings from that time period of the Renaissance. Um, on the left, you have the painting by Donato Creti, that's in the National Gallery in London. And on the right, you have, of course, a Rembrandt, which those who might be traveling on ASA's tour to the US, uh, you will visit the National Gallery and you'd be able to see uh, this Rembrandt painting in person. And for my fellow gardeners and flora fans, 
A different legacy for Artemisia II comes down to us in the name of the Artemisia genus of plants. According to the Roman writer Pliny the Elder in his Natural Histories, the Artemisia plant is named for this queen because she was an avid botanist and medical researcher. And some scholars have even posited that she was perhaps using the plant to treat malaria, which is rather astounding because one of our anti-malarial treatments today is actually derived from Artemisia. Like the queen before her, Artemisia II was recognized in her own time as a good naval commander and strategist. When her brother or husband died and she assumed the throne, several of their island holdings revolted against having a woman on the throne. She rallied her navy and using clever stratagems that went down in the history books, she defeated them all and regained the territories in revolt, including Rhodes. So today, when you stroll around the harbors of Bodrum, which this is Bodrum, and Rhodes down here, or the island of Kos, give a nod of your head to Queen Artemisia II. She walked there before you and actually ruled them. So that is just very quickly two of the princes I wanted to highlight because they're really phenomenal figures in history that we don't hear very much about. So I hope that you're learning about the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, in fact, not being built by Mausolus, but by his wife, Artemisia II, is a nice little bit and juicy uh, factoid for the day. This is just to give you four examples from those sites about the rocky and non-agricultural landscape that these sites are situated on. So in the upper left-hand corner here is just a glimpse of an area around the site of Phasilus. Over here is Olympus, and you can see, like, the ancient city is buried or today, not buried, but uh, surrounded in this forest here, and really it was just this extremely narrow defile to get inland from the coast. And there is simply no agricultural land there for many kilometers inland. Down here in the lower left is Gamalar Island. And again, you can see, and this is not the result of modern day post-industrial age deforestation or anything. This is really what the island looked like pretty much all through human history. And over here we have a site that's another, this is not a site we'll be visiting, but it's near Sea Bay. And I liked the photo because it showed, again, one of these very inaccessible, tiny little places. Like, the only farming in the area is in this tiny little V-shaped valley here. The second theme I wanted to talk about in this lecture were pirates. Piracy in the Mediterranean has occurred since at least the Bronze Age, and probably even further back into prehistory. Piracy is so intertwined in human history of the region that it permeates even the myths that came out of the region. So here, for example, you can see a Roman period mosaic panel that was found in Tunisia, and it depicts here part of the Dionysus cycle. And in this story, uh, he prevents the ships that his ship and the other ships that were traveling with him from being overtaken by the pirates by turning them all into dolphins, except one who he kept and ultimately joined his retinue. So we're going to talk a little bit about pirates along the turquoise coast. Now, to do that, we first need to understand a bit about the Mediterranean itself and its geography. So once again, we're going to take a look at a Google map here. If you note, and if you've traveled there yourself, you'll note that, especially in the eastern Mediterranean, the land is either very rocky or very sandy. And these are really not good regions for large-scale farming before the modern day and the introduction of you know, mechanical irrigation and so forth. So frequently in antiquity, people along these regions, excluding the Egyptian Delta down here, but it's really up here along the southern coast of Turkey, and here, of course, down even into what is today the modern state of Israel and Lebanon and Syria, 
And of course, over here along the North African coast, people really struggled to survive and were very much at the whims of if the weather was bad and the crops failed, people died. So it really is a perfect area to breed piracy uh, because when other options to make a living just ceased to be available, very often people would take to piracy. And on this tour, we'll be visiting five sites that are explicitly linked to piracy in the Eastern Mediterranean. We'll have uh, Sea Day, which we'll talk about a bit more in a few minutes, Fossilis, Olympos, Kos, and the Gemmelar Island. Um, Gemmelar Island is the outlier here in that these other four sites are very explicitly linked to the second and first centuries BC with the Cilician pirates. Gemmelar Island's tie to piracy is much, much later during the Islamic period. And it's Muslim pirates that were attacking the Gemmelar Island. So we won't be talking about that tonight. So I'm really going to talk about the Cilician pilots. So another factor that uh, allowed piracy to be such a prevalent occurrence in the Eastern Mediterranean was really the design of the ships. So on the left here, I've, I've given a drawing of a first to second century Roman merchant ship. Now, when you can see that it's not very sleek, it's not very aero or hydrodynamic, and when it was loaded down with goods, it would kind of wallow in the water. So the seagoing vessels and the navigation technologies of the merchant ships were very much a factor in why piracy was so successful. On your right-hand side is an ancient Greek trireme, or in this case, just uh, I can't actually tell from the drawing whether it's supposed to be a trireme or not, but let's just say it's, a, it's an oared ship. The sails weren't as important as the oars, but it's sleek and it can move very, very fast, much faster than the merchant ships could. And although the ship on the right is from a couple of centuries earlier, the same type of ship was still largely used by the Cilician pirates in the second and first centuries BC, because why change what works? And the third factor is very few ships at the time could sail across the open water of the Mediterranean. Most shipping of all types, in merchant and transport and even the transportation of troops, they had to coast. They had to stay within sight of the coast and they would either dock on land or anchor off the coast at night because they needed to be able to see the landmarks of the shoreline to know exactly where they were and where to go next. Because you'll all remember that it was not until the 19th century that humanity really solved, or at least the Western humanity, solved the ability to calculate longitude. They could do latitude, but they didn't have accurate chronometers, so they were unable to know when they changed from uh, one longitudinal zone to another. So navigation was either by the stars, uh, which wasn't so effective at the east-west loci as it was for the north-south loci. And of course, the other reason they would coast is they were so laden down in the case of the merchant ships that uh, they were carrying cargo that they were trying to make money with. So they would have to stop frequently to resupply for food and fresh water. Now, all of these factors made the Turkish coast quite ideal for the pirates to be successful. They would take advantage of this rocky coastline and the hidden little inlets, like some of the ones that you can see here. And in the case of this cave, which is near the site of Kos, they would actually use these caves. And you can see here, this little tourist boat can actually sail inside the cave. And so the pirates would take advantage of this topography in order to ambush, they would hide and then they would rush out in their fast ships 
and capture those slow moving, heavily laden passing ships. And it was very successful. Today, I want to focus a bit more on specifically the Cilician pirates of the second and first centuries BCE. First, though, we have to understand that the name Cilician pirates is a bit of a misnomer, even though we use it all throughout uh, modern scholarship, because it suggests that the pirates originated only from Cilicia. And in truth, at the very beginning of the piracy of this period, they did come from Cilicia. But eventually, they came from all over. And the word Cilician and pirates today is really just used to refer to any piracy that took place in the Eastern Mediterranean up to the end of the Roman Republic in 31 BC. All right, so the rise of organized piracy in the Mare Nostrum, or the Roman word for the Mediterranean, they called it our sea, really began to coalesce after the Roman Republic destroyed Carthage, ending the Punic Wars in 146 BC. So Carthage is over here off the map. And this coincided at the same period with this empire shown in green, which was the Seleucid Empire, and the Ptolemaic Empire, which was based in Egypt. And of course, these are the empires, the two major ones, that were established by generals of Alexander the Great after his death. Uh, and they reigned throughout this region and controlled it for more than 200 years, 250 years. By the mid second century, no strong organized power remained in the region to keep the pirates in check. Rome had just, was the only game in town, the Republican Rome. They had defeated the Punic Carthaginians, so who had been the sea power before, and the Romans were took a long time to recover themselves from the many Punic Wars. The Ptolemies here in Egypt were a dying dynasty, same with the Seleucids. And so basically, around this time period, the pirates had free reign, and they were the sea power in the region. And the Republican Romans, who would have been the only ones who, and of course, way over here off the map, would have been able to keep them in check, really had no interest in doing so because as Republican Rome was itself rebuilding after the Punic Wars ended, they were desperate for a steady source of cheap slaves. And the pirates, one of the major things that the Cilician pirates sold were slaves. And they did so by raiding inland. And so here we have a sea battle going on in this drawing of pirates. But they didn't just raid sea ships, but also would do uh, excursions into coastal towns and into those isolated valleys all along that Mediterranean littoral. And that's where they would get the majority of their slaves. And during this period, when there is no power to keep them in check, they basically established port towns as operation bases throughout the central and eastern Mediterranean. Initially, these were on the island of Crete and over here in the region of Cilicia, again, where we get the name for the Cilician pilots. But eventually, the island of Delos, which is right over here, if you can see my pointer, it's one of these little islands over here. That became the main market for the Cilician slaves, was on Delos. But over here, so just about underneath where the word Perga is, you have the coastal town of Side, which is one of the sites we'll visit on the uh, Turquoise Coast tour. Uh, this became the Cilician pirates' main naval base. And it had to do with the fact that it had two protected harbors. This is a modern man-made harbor here on the right. But you can get a glimpse of the larger harbor off in the distance there and the nearer harbor here. And they were shallow harbors, ideal for the low-draft ships of the time. 
And these are just a couple of quick images to show some of the ruins that are one can visit today in Sida. Like off here, we have the Temple of Apollo that sits right on the edge of one of the harbors. Now, they had be the Cilician pirates had become very wealthy, and when they made Sea Day their main naval base, it was also their major collection and distribution center for the slaves that they would then move further to the west and sell in the Roman markets. They got very wealthy, and a lot of the monuments that one can see ruins of today in Sea Day were begun in their first phases by profits made from the selling of slaves and built by the Cilician pirates. Those monuments would then be, most of them were then changed and developed and made even larger uh, once the Romans came in. Now, around 100 BC, the Roman Republic realized that by neglecting con to control the pirates had been a mistake. The predation the pirates were carrying out on the trading and supply ships had become far too costly. And the availability of the cheap slaves was no longer enough to offset the loss of revenue that was coming in. Well, not just revenue, but also foodstuffs, because they would raid the grain ships coming from Af North Africa and the um, Levant. Uh, the, de the grain that Rome desperately and always desperately needed, for example. So it became a real problem. And they finally took action around 100 BC, and it ultimately would lead to three major expeditions and some 40 years uh, before they would be able to get the pirates under control. Uh, the first of these was led in 102 BC by a man named Marcus Antonius, the orator. And he did root the pirates out of coastal Cilicia, but it was a short-lived victory. Ironically, like very typical of the Romans, he went back, declared victory, and they gave him a triumph. But the reality is the pirates merely fled from Cilicia and went to their bases on Crete, hung out there for a while, regrouped, and eventually returned to the eastern Mediterranean and continued. Rome said, hey, we did what we could threw up their hands and went back to ignoring the problem until it got worse again. So in 78, 74 BC, so not quite 30 years later, they dispatched a second expedition, this time by Publius Servilius Vatia Isoricus, um, who incidentally I could not find a, a statue of, so I was kind of surprised, but so here we have him on a coin. And he spent nearly four years between 78 and 74 BC campaigning, trying to do what Marcus Antonius had done. He too had a full army and a full fleet. And despite having a full army and a full fleet at his disposal, he only quelled the piracy for a little bit, but he went back to Rome and declared victory and they threw him a triumph. Uh, so it wasn't till a decade later that we the Senate takes its final action, and they dispatch in 66 BC Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, known to history as Pompey the Great. Well, this man was a military genius, and in two short campaigns during the course of one summer, a total of 89 days, he obliterated the pirate threat, uh, and thereafter, there was not a piracy problem in the Mediterranean until the Byzantine, the late Byzantine Empire. I mean, obviously there would be pirates that would crop up here and there, but never an organized piracy kingdom, if you will, on the high seas that there had been during the reign of the Cilician pirates. Oh, and incidentally, Pompey the Great here on the right, um, while he was out there, he annexed Rome's first province in Syria, and, well, that kind of set the Republic on the road toward becoming an empire. But that's a story for another day. So the last theme I want to touch on today is pilgrims. And this, quite honestly, was the most difficult of the themes to, to decide what to write about. Because there are so many pilgrims that crossed 
that natural landmass that the, the Anatolia Peninsula actually is connecting Europe to Asia. So which story do I tell? Do I talk about the Sufi pilgrims who came or the, the various Christian, the many Christian pilgrims that came through from the 5th century AD all the way up through to the modern day? Or maybe Egeria, who you know, did her travels in, the, in late antiquity. But in the end, it was the, it was the region of the turquoise coast itself that helped me decide. You'll recall that we talked about how the Anatolian Peninsula is naturally segregated into three regions. Well, natural isolation of the southern coast from the upland plateaus, with it where there are well-traveled roads, that's where most of the pilgrims actually traversed across the landmass. The coastal port cities were really much more about embarkation and disembarkation for travelers coming and going. Uh, to get onto one of the roads that would take them to wherever, whichever pilgrimage site they were going to. So this transience, if you will, of pilgrims passing through the coastal areas really hasn't left much of a trace. So I couldn't really find much to use to illustrate this talk. So I decided instead to tell the story of the Order of Knights of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem also known as the Knights Hospita Hospitallers, and how they came to be on the island of Rhodes and later Halicarnassus as well, as these are two of the final sites we'll be visiting on the Turquoise Coast trip. But wait, you might be saying, why are you talking to us about Crusader Knights when you're supposed to be talking about pilgrims? Well, it's not as strange as it might seem. In 1074, Pope Gregory VII began planning a military campaign to take back Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the Muslims. And right from the very beginning, he envisioned this to be a righteous, albeit armed, pilgrimage. It fell to Pope Urban II, and here we have Gregory VII and Urban II on the right, 20 years after Gregory VII first proposed to do this, it wasn't until Pope Urban II in 1095, got the ball rolled. And he did so by, in, when attending two different ecclesiastical councils in Western Europe, he preached the need for an armed pilgrimage to rescue the Holy Land from the infidels. The crowds were sw so swayed by his words and his vision that he conveyed, they all cried out spontaneously, Deus la volta, or God wills it and the movement toward the First Crusade was launched. Okay, well, the whole story of the many, 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 like really a lot of the Catholic Crusades is too epic to tell here, and quite honestly, a bit gruesome. Big picture, Europeans did reconquer the Holy Land, established a kingdom and some fiefdoms, but held them for less than a century. But they kept coming back and trying again and again and again. Along the way, the Catholic popes commissioned a number of orders of holy knights. Most of you have probably heard of the Knights Templar, and one of the others was the Knights Hospital. In 1099, following the capture of Jerusalem, a group of knights banded together to create a religious order focused on religious devotion, protecting pilgrims, and specifically providing charity to the poor. They chose as their enclave an existing hospital in the city of Jerusalem that was dedicated already to St. John the Baptist. And not long after, this group was formalized by a papal charter and the Knights Hospitaller were born. And here you can see a couple of pictures of the Moristan in Jerusalem, uh, which is a region in the Christian quarter of the old city, uh, which is the location of that original Hospital of St. John. And this curved section of this old building now is a gateway into one of the markets, but it probably was originally part of that Bimuristan building that was the basis for the Knights Hospitaller in Jerusalem. In 1291, the Knights had to leave the Moristan when the Holy Land was lost, and they needed to find a new home. So they ended up 
on Cyprus. And this is the Colossi Castle in Limassol, Cyprus. And this remained their base of operations from 1291 all the way through to, well, not for honestly that long, about 20 years, because they left Cyprus in about 1310, 1309, 1310. Because during that two decade or so period they were on the island of Cyprus, they had a lot of trouble with the then Cypriot king, Henry II, and the situation just became untenable. So their grandmaster for the knights decided that the island of Rhodes would be a much better place for them. Well, unfortunately, Rhodes was still under the control of the last remnants of the Byzantine Empire. So what did the Grand Master do? He traveled to France to get the blessing of the then Pope in Avignon and also to have a meeting with King Philip IV, uh, which was, of course, a very strategic thing for him to do on one level because Philip IV, also known as Philip the Good or Philip the Beautiful, had just kind of destroyed, well, did actually destroy the Knights Templar two years before. So he, this Grand Master of the Knights Hospitaller did not want to be on Philip IV's bad side. But anyways, uh, the Pope and the King agreed to help them. A fleet was dispatched in 1308, and they land, landed on and besieged Rhodes. It took a few years, but Rhodes eventually surrendered. And so by August of 1310, the island became the new home of the Knights Hospitaller. And it would remain their base of operations until 1522, when the Ottoman Sultan, the one who built so many of the monuments in Istanbul, Suleiman the Magnificent, captured the island. And the defeated hospitalers were permitted to withdraw to Sicily until they eventually moved to Malta and built the city of Valletta as their home base. So in these four images, you get, I'm just giving you a couple of glimpses of the Knights Hospitaller Fortress and Castle on the island of Rhodes. During the same time that they captured Rhodes, they built, they also gained control of the Helicarnassus Peninsula, and they built this massive castle off here to the lower left, Petronium Castle, today known as the Bodrum Castle. And they managed to hold this from 1310 to that same year, 1522, when Suleiman the Magnificent you know, drove them out of the region. But this peninsula was completely surrounded by the Ottoman Turks during that entire time. And they managed to, to hold it for all those, for you know, two centuries. And one of the ways they did it was by building this massive fortress. And this fortress is built largely out of stone that was quarried from the ruins of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. And that brings us full circle back to where we started with the story of the Queen Artemisia's of Caria, and specifically the devotion of Queen Artemisia II for her beloved brother husband when she oversaw the building of his mausoleum. Thank you very much. I hope you've learned something and found this to be enjoyable. That was really fascinating, Christopher. Thank you so much. I loved learning about badass queens and uh, pirates and pilgrims who were knights. And uh, you just gave us so much fascinating information. Thank you very much indeed. It was a really intriguing talk. Does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Christopher? Not so much a question, more a comment. Uh, Chris constantly harps on about his Nabataeans and his second century and his Romans and stuff. I'd just like to point out that there were Bronze Age pirates storming those shores thousands of years beforehand. Yes, Mary's absolutely right. Uh, but I had to pick a theme. Yes, the piracy goes way back, and I suspect even before the Bronze Age. No, thank you. It was, it was fantastic. Thank you. And it's just, you know, it's just fascinating. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you all join with me in thanking Christopher for a really fascinating lecture. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Christopher. 
thank you to ASA and good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for taking time out of your evenings to join us tonight. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.